Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. Today we've got a great new show as we construct a new raised bed by repurposing a different product. We learn how to repot orchids. I've got an update on the pallet garden. And finally, entomologist Dr. Eric Rebeck provides solutions for those invading fall army worms. It can be overwhelming if you're new to gardening. With all the different products out there, you might feel like you have to buy certain products in order to be successful, or certain kits in order to be successful. Or you might think it's just as simple as throwing the seeds out in the garden and watching Mother Nature do its work. Well, I can't say that it's always that simple. However, there no, is no right product for the garden. In fact, all gardens look different based off of a lot of different factors, including your physical ability, your level of maintenance, your level of aesthetics that you're wanting to present, your soil, and of course your budget are just a few of those factors to consider. Now, we are in this space that we've mentioned as a backyard demonstration garden where we're demonstrating different ways of growing fruits and vegetables in your backyard. And over the seasons, we've talked about growing in stock tanks and in straw bells and different, different ways of growing in raised beds. But we have a new idea we want to show with you, and this is called a straw waddle. Now you probably have seen this product in construction sites where it's used often to slow the flow of water and to reduce erosion, but we are using it here to create the perimeter for a raised bed. Now you can find these at uh, home goods or home construction uh, sites, hardware stores, um, or you can possibly find old ones that are no longer used on construction sites. So we've anchored this down with a couple of pieces of rebar in order to you know, make sure that it doesn't move too much. What's nice about this is it comes in 25 foot links and about an eight to nine inch diameter. So it really does make the ideal depth. And because it's just a flexible net tube of straw, you can shape this into whatever design you want to make it into. Now we've used one just to make a circle. And I will say it makes the ideal circle because it allows you to really reach into that center. So it's not too big or not too small. We've gone ahead and sprayed out the Bermuda grass in the center and underneath it. Um, and if you wanted to, that's all you would need to do other than fill it with soil and get ready to plant it. Now, because we live in Oklahoma and we have to contend with that creeping Bermuda grass, we've gone ahead and done a few extra measures in order to prevent that Bermuda grass from creeping in. So a couple of things that we've done is we have put a heavy landscape uh, fabric down underneath this, underneath the pavers and also the straw wattle. Now we did not do it on the center so that we can allow that root zone to penetrate into the topsoil that's existing already if, if it wants to. The other thing is we made use of some pavers that we already had and created a perimeter around this. Again, just to prevent that Bermuda grass from creeping in. And what this does is it sort of allows us kind of a, a buffer zone for that Bermuda grass that we can control it before it gets into our raised bed. So now you can see we've got the raised bed built. We have, of course, one more thing to do, and that is to fill it with some soil. So you could, if you wanted to, if you didn't have enough soil, there's no reason why you couldn't use organic matter that you have existing. If it's the time of year you're constructing this, that you have a lot of grass clippings or ornamental grass cuttings, you could fill that and then put soil, sort of like the keyhole style. There's no reason why you couldn't do that. At this point though, we're just gonna go ahead and fill it with some topsoil and compost. 
So you can see we've got our raised bed filled with a nice mix of topsoil and also compost. And we chose, we had this uh, obelisk that we went ahead and put in the center. So I think we're gonna get some, uh, maybe some sweet peas or something to climb on a little later. But for right now, we're gonna go ahead and plant our fall crop. Um, and so we've got some just root crops and some lettuce that we're gonna plant in here. And just to give it a little bit of more of an aesthetic look um, we're going to quarter this off based off of the corners of our obelisk here and plant a crop in each uh, section now to kind of section that a little bit better we have a product here that i do want to show you in case you're always concerned or worried about having to thin your crop um, because when you often sow a lot of times those seeds are right next door to each other and so you'll want to go back through and kind of thin it in order to allow that root crop to really develop to its full maturity but this is a product called Seed Tape. Um, and you can see that it comes, you know, a lot of different crops will come in this product of Seed Tape. And what's nice about it is it's already predetermined as far as the spacing on it. So it's basically like tissue paper, um, kind of has that texture. So as you water it, it will break down. So the nice thing about this seed tape is it sort of organizes your garden a little bit. It makes it simple. We won't have to come back and thin those seeds quite as much as we would if we had just sowed it with our hand. Also, you'll notice that the seeds are sort of uh, predetermined on a three inch spacing on this particular one for the beets. Um, and so that kind of takes out some of that guesswork if you're new to gardening as well. And you'll also notice on the package, just if you're curious about how many seeds you're getting, so it includes on this particular product, 22 and a half feet of tape, which includes about 130 seeds. So this product costs around $8. So it's a little bit more than just a package of seeds. Um, but again, you're getting that efficiency of knowing your spacing already on that. So on either side here of this particular one, we're gonna plant some lettuce and some carrots. Um, and then it's just a matter of watering it in and you've got a fall garden crop planted. Hi, I'm Doug Needham, former professor of horticulture at Oklahoma State University. It's a pleasure to have you here today to talk about orchid repotting. It's one of the most common questions I get. When should I repot? What kind of media should I use? How big a pot should it be in? All those things that you're probably wondering about the orchid that you're growing in your home. Let's take a look at some of the more common orchids that you might have in your home. Maybe you have some cattleyas. So this is a, a cattleya type orchid. And notice how it's come from the grower in Florida and it's been potted in, a, in like a gravel or a stone. Well, I don't care to grow in stone, so we're gonna look at repotting that one today. Paphiopetalum, maybe you grow some paphiopetalums. These are so well adapted to the low light environment of the home. And uh, interestingly, a paphiopetalum really prefers to be repotted about every year and it will put out in fresh root growth when that's done. So we'll look at repotting that one even though it hasn't been in this pot all that long. So with a paphiopetalum, it does not have pseudobulbs the way the uh, Calia does and so it doesn't have a, a moisture storage organ so it needs to stay a little bit more moist. So with that paphiopetalum, I would use a mixture of power, what's called power orchiata. So this is kind of a medium uh, grade of bark, about three eighths to half inch pieces. The smaller uh, coarse, number three coarse perlite, and then the fine biochar. And use that same two parts bark, one part perlite, one part of the, um, the biochar. And then with 
papiopetalums, they tend to be uh, deficient on calcium. And so it's very helpful to use some oyster shells in that as well. And so just a teaspoon of fine oyster shell mixed into that, and that will provide the calcium that that plant needs. Or maybe you like to grow the dendrobiums. Dendrobiums are super popular. And this one we can see is just beginning to send out a new growth right beside this brand new growth. And look at all the new roots. That's perfect timing for repotting. And it's right at the edge of the pot, so it's time to put it in one just a little bit bigger. The dendrobium can go just, in, you can see in this particular, the uh, grower had used a bark and perlite mix, but it would be just as happy in plain, what we call power orchiata, that medium grade bark. So we could move it into that. Probably the most common orchid grown in the home is the Phalaenopsis. And this Phalaenopsis, you can see, has grown so many roots, aerial roots, because air is just as important as water to the roots of an orchid. They are epiphytes, meaning that they typically grow attached to trees and they just uh, get moisture from the fog that goes through or the rain, but they're always exposed to ample air. This one's growing in a plastic pot, but because it's so large, it topples over. So I keep it in a, sitting in a clay pot just so it doesn't fall over. So it's time to move that up to a more stable pot even though it's in full bloom. And then this Phalaenopsis came from the grower in sphagnum moss. So many commercial growers grow Phalaenopsis in long fiber sphagnum moss. We could certainly repot it into fresh sphagnum moss, or you could move it into just that same power orchiata, that nice medium grade bark. All right, well, let's pot up one of these orchids. Let's start with this Cattleya here. And one of the things that is absolutely imperative to, to recall is that viruses are a problem in orchids. And a plant can have a virus and you may not know it. So it's really important to wear gloves, put on a fresh pair of gloves with each plant that you're gonna work on, and then make sure that the, the surface the work surface is clean. So the, this uh, head house that I work in, the countertops are all stainless steel. So we want to clean that surface, the countertop, just with a, a disinfecting wipe. Wipe that down really well. And then your pruning shears, you need to clean those as well. So that same wipe you can use to clean off the pruning shear. If you happen to have a little torch, a little butane torch, you can even use that to flame off the pruning shear that kills the viruses. And then of course, my mnemonic vice, close it and you know it's ready to go for the next use. So let's clear some of these things out of the way here and take a look here at this orchid. So we're gonna get that label out. We wanna keep track of the label because that's what tells us the name of that orchid. And then literally just gonna pour out this media. So we'll get that right into the bucket. Gently get all that rocky media off. Now we can see better the root system of this plant. And of course, it's really a perfect time because look at these nice green tips. That's the roots in active growth and you can see fresh ones emerging right there. But notice here at the very back, this is the oldest part of the plant. And you can see that these roots are pretty brown and the core is just stripping away the, the vellum from the outside. So what I would recommend is literally remove that oldest part and let's kind of move, go back to about where those new, or where the white roots are and we're gonna cut right through the rhizome and look at there, see there's no roots left on that part. So we'll put that into compost and here's a little bit more that we need to trim out. And at that point, I think this plant is now ready to be repotted. One last thing that I tend to do before repotting is these old uh, pseudobulb coverings here, this papery covering. Peel that off. <clears throat> it, um, it provides a, a place for insects to hide. So you can just grab a hold of that and just gently peel it down, 
peel that off and get rid of it and that way then there's not a hiding spot. There's a particular scale insect that really loves to get down under those and hide and that way you're not at risk of having those. Well that's ready to be repotted and one of the questions I'm often asked is, well what potting mix do you use? There are so many different potting mixes available for growing orchids and there's really no one magic mix. You can use whatever is easiest for you. So if it's easier to go to your local garden center and buy a pre-mixed orchid mix, that'll work just great. But if you've got several orchids and you want to be able to mix up your own, you can do that as well. And that's all there is to it. So as I said, there's no magic mix. It's just whatever works well in your environment and how frequently that you tend to be watering your orchids. If you'd like to know more information about growing orchids, the American Orchid Society, AOS.org, is an excellent resource. And I encourage all of you to reach out to your local AOS affiliate Orchid Society and become a member. In Oklahoma, we have two. There's one based in Tulsa, the Tulsa Orchid Society, which has a Facebook page. And in uh, the Oklahoma City, there is the Oklahoma Orchid Society. And it has a full website with all kinds of helpful resource information. So we encourage you to learn more about orchids and come to a meeting and, and really engage with people that are passionate about sharing their love of growing orchids. to give you a quick update on our pallet garden. Now we built this several years ago and it's holding up, although I think this might be the last year on it. But we wanted to show you how much you can plant in just a four by four square box. So on the upright edges of the pallet, so it's just again about a three or four foot or four inch spacing around the perimeter, we have planted uh, boxwood basil. Now we cut this back pretty regularly to keep it fresh looking and to keep that hedge look. Inside our box, we have three different plants. We have two peppers. We have Just Sweet, which is a sweet pepper. Then we also have an Aji Rico, which is a little bit of a spicier pepper. We also have a little patio uh, tomato called Husky Red. So we've got three different plants in here, and then we've got all this boxwood. Now on the back, we've got a little surprise. Because we built our pallet garden with a full pallet on the back side, we can utilize the vertical space on the back here for trellising different stuff. Now you could put cucumbers, but we tried a couple of different beans. We've got a pretzel bean here. You can see it's starting to make that pretzel shape. Then we also have a red yard bean. So it gets this yard long bean on it and ours are starting to take off here. And then finally uh, we have a pocket of strawberries that are growing on the back here. So you can see how the strawberries have really uh, taken off and trailed. Of course they're not producing anymore at this time but we've got several that we can cut off and plant elsewhere in our garden. So there you have it. You can grow a lot of produce in just a small 4x4 four four area in your backyard. out at the Botanic Garden here at OSU to talk about fall armyworm. Uh, this is a caterpillar pest that definitely likes to feed on turf grasses and you may have noticed these in your lawns this, this summer. Uh, this species uh, is native to North America. It overwinters in the Gulf states. Uh, it uh, reproduces continuously in those areas and then it migrates on southerly winds uh, in the summertime. And so here in Oklahoma, we don't see these uh, critters arriving until late summer into the early fall, 
which is why we call them fall armyworm. So how do we identify fall armyworm? Well, these are uh, caterpillars that, uh, they, they kind of have a different appearance, uh, even within the same species. So from one individual to the next, they can range from a, a pinkish coloration to kind of a yellowish, uh, greenish color. Uh, and then they can get very dark into the grays and almost black as well. So they do vary uh, from individual to individual in their appearance. When they're fully grown, they're, they're about, they reach about an inch in length. And one thing they all have in common, despite that difference in coloration, uh, is they all have an inverted Y-shaped uh, marking on their head capsules. So uh, even without magnification on those larger caterpillars, you can see that distinct feature that shows that inverted Y. Uh, the fall armyworm uh, develops through uh, several instars. Those are different growth stages. Uh, and right now we're experiencing this generation and they're, the, the, they're into their late uh, instar and they're just doing some extensive damage as they're, uh, as they're feeding. Of course, as these caterpillars get large, they, they consume more material and it causes more damage to our, our lawns. There's actually two strains, uh, genetically distinct strains of fall armyworm. Uh, there's a corn strain, which prefers corn and other tall grass uh, crops. And then there's the rice strain, which prefers turf grasses. And that's exactly what we're, we're seeing here. So really that strain differentiation is, it comes down to their food preference. Uh, and as I mentioned, they, they do feed on a wide variety of, of plants, but they really do have a preference for turf grasses, in particular Bermuda grass, followed by some of our cool season grasses. Uh, the Bermuda grass that we see here uh, that's uh, behind us is, is heavily infested this year, which may be a common sight uh, throughout lawns and gardens and uh, golf courses and other landscapes throughout Oklahoma this year. Bermuda grass, after it's been fed upon by, uh, by fall armyworm, it, it does have a tendency to recover faster, especially if it's well managed uh, with good watering and good fertilization. Uh, and that's because of the growth habit of Bermuda grass uh, and, and to a certain extent zoysia grasses as well. Our cool season grasses like our fescues uh, and our rye grasses are going to be slower to recover. Um, and in fact, if the infestation is heavy enough, um, the, the caterpillars can actually kill uh, those types of cool season grasses. So the question on everyone's minds is how to get rid of these caterpillars. And the most quick and effective way uh, is to use a properly labeled insecticide that you can find at a garden shop or a box store. Uh, so that's for the homeowner side. So anything that's labeled for caterpillar management on turf grass. Primarily, we're talking about pyrethroid-based insecticides. Uh, the commercial applicator will have uh, more tools at their disposal for, for management. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that um, these critters They'll be around in our lawns until we get our first killing frost. So after that occurs, there's no need to treat anymore. And again, remember that uh, properly managed Bermuda grass can recover from fall armyworm feeding. Now, if you're considering starting a new lawn in a landscape, uh, you can look for certain varieties and cultivars of some of our warm season grasses like Bermuda grass and zoysia grass and even some of our cool season grasses that are genetically resistant to fall armyworms. So there's a lot of research out there that shows uh, this preference or this resistance that's built into some of these different lineages of, of both warm season and, and cool season turf grasses as a management option, a prevention option in the long run uh, for fall armyworm invasions. So just remember, a fall armyworm does not overwinter in Oklahoma. This is a very cold sensitive species and it just cannot survive uh, winters here. Uh, the new invasions that we see every summer into the fall are coming up as adult moths from the uh, southerly states, those Gulf Coast states. So uh, we, management's not necessary after that first killing frost. For more information about fall armyworm or other insects and diseases that might be affecting your landscape, uh, you can look at an important resource that we have at the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology website called Pest E-Alerts for updated information about uh, this and other pests. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead.
Next week on Oklahoma Gardening, we explore more of Dee Nash's garden, take a look at some squash trials, and talk pre-emergence. So join us then. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussion on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and Tulsa Garden Club. <laughs>